programming with uh, just finishing up on polymorphism uh, and then uh, the solid principles, which are uh, kind of a, a tacked on at the end uh, for uh, object oriented programming. I, I, it, it came at the, the, the ideas came after object oriented programming to describe the, uh, some of the best practices for using OOP. Uh, but otherwise, on Thursday, we'll start with SQL, databases, database design, uh, and then we'll move on from there. Uh, let me go ahead and turn these down a little bit. There you go. All right, so we went over uh, the tutorial kind of uh, of um, a polymorphism in the uh, in the context of bounded uh, parametric polymorphism, right? If you uh, we, we started out as you know very very low level of we wanted to compute uh, get the maximum value of a set of or a list of strings uh, or a list of uh, numbers. Then we made it more and more general so that it's not just a list, but it's any old coll collection so that we can. Uh, you do it with sets and anything else that we might uh, find. Uh, and then we uh, generalized that even more so that it didn't work ju just with numbers, it worked with any types that were orderable, that this thing is larger than this thing. Uh, then we went too far uh, and, uh, in our generalization, so we, uh, and we lost uh, what it means to be a number or what it means to be comparable, so we had to bring it back down. Uh, and all of those things are aspects of uh, parameterized polymorphism. But there are other types of polymorphism that pop up in Java code and other programming languages all the time. One of those things is method overloading. Uh, if you think back to C last semester, how many absolute value functions did we have? We had abs, thabs, labs, and if you really wanted to get into it, lalabs, dabs, and, a, and maybe a, a half a dozen or a dozen different things that did the same thing. They, they computed the absolute value. But they computed the absolute value on different types, longs, doubles, floats, integers, right? Uh, and we ha they had to have different names because C didn't support polymorphism. It didn't support method overloading. Well, in Java, that's a different story. Uh, in Java, we do have method overloading. Uh, you can define multiple methods in, with, with the same name in the same class as long as they differ in, in the number or in the type of parameters. Right. Uh, and you'll do this tomorrow in lab, but I will, do want to show you one example here. Let me go ahead and pull up a Java, uh, I don't know, math, the math library. Uh, since we're talking about absolute value, let's pull up the Java math library. And let's look and see how many absolute value functions do we have. Likewise, we, we have several, right? Here we have four of them. One works on doubles, one works on floats, one works on integers, one work, works on longs. Uh, those are the four basic numeric types uh, in Java. We don't have a half a dozen of them because we don't have as many uh, primitive types uh, as we do in say, C, or extensions of C, more accurately. But they're all the same name. There's no fabs, labs, dabs, etc. They're all abs. Uh, and the way that you know that they're different is by looking at their uh, the, the, the parameter, right? One takes a double, one takes a float, et cetera, et cetera. Now, compilers are dumb, but compilers can figure some things out. When you write out code that calls math.abs and you give it an integer uh, as, uh, as input, then the compiler can see, oh, you, you, uh, you're, you're giving me an input uh, as an integer, so you must have meant the third one right there. And it dispatches it and compiles it to the correct one. Uh, you call a math.abs on a double, and it says, oh, you must have meant the first one, so it calls that function. They are, th four, they are four different functions. They are actually four different pieces of code that live inside the math library and math, math class. But the compiler is smart enough to be able to determine, to deduce that, oh, you probably meant that one over there. So let's take another look at another example here, Java string. All right. There we go. Uh, find two string. There we go. So uh, is that what I want? Uh, two string. No, what did I want? I wanted. Uh, oh, I wanted integer. Java integer, not two string, uh, or a string. Find two string. There we go. How many two string methods do we have in the integer class? Two of them are static, and one of them is non-static, meaning that it belongs to every integer, every instance of an integer. Uh, but here, uh, and they all return a string because to string, I, I expect a string back. 
but they all differ in the number of parameters. The first one has no parameters, the second one has one parameter, and the third one has two parameters. So again, the compiler is done, but it's able to figure out which one you meant. If you gave it no parameters, it says, oh, okay, you probably meant the first one. If you gave it one parameter, it probably say, oh, you meant the second one, as long as it was an integer. Uh, now, if you gave it one parameter and that parameter was a, a double or a, a string or a student type, then it would be a compiler error because it would say, all right, you gave me one, uh, one, one, one input value, but it wasn't an integer, so you're not calling, I don't know what function you're talking about, compiler error. Uh, but if you gave it two, both of them integers, then it would mean that one right there. Uh, they, each one of them has different functionality, but the same type of functionality. It converts something to an integer. Uh, the first one converts it to base 10. The second one converts it, uh, but uh, converts a, a primitive type to its string type without you having to create an integer type. Uh, the third one, however, is a little bit different. It takes, it, it takes an integer that you want to convert to a string, but then it also takes a radix. What's a radix? Hint, the radix for our base system decimal is 10. What if we gave it 2? What would it convert it to? A string representation of a bi uh, its binary representation. What if we gave it 8? That's, what do we call that? No? Octal, right? It would convert it to an octal representation. And I don't have enough fingers to show it, but if we convert it to 16, it would give us a hexadecimal representation. So very nice functionality in there that it converts it to a string, but this one does it one way depending on the, uh, uh, the parameters that you give it. This one does it a different way depending on the parameters that you give it. But we don't have to worry that it's two string basic, two string static, two string uh, with radix, right? We don't have to call those things different names because we have method overloading. You can overload what a method means, right? Uh, so again, you, uh, uh, the, uh, you, uh, you must uh, have a difference, uh, a big enough difference, that is the number or type of uh, parameters, so that the compiler, compiler can, figure out, can figure out which one you wanted to call. Right? The compiler does this at compile time. Right, it is called uh, this. Me uh, it, it, it is called called static dispatch. Right? It's dispatching which function you actually wanted to call, but it does it statically. We've heard this terminology before. Something dispatch, but we call it dynamic dispatch. Remember what dynamic dispatch was? It was done at runtime. When you create two, say a bank, uh, I've got two bank accounts. One of them is a savings account, and one of them is a uh, what did we do? Checking account, right? And you wanted to call a method of get monthly earnings on it, or yearly earnings, or something like that, right? It did it at runtime because it didn't know. Well, th this is a bank account. This is a bank account. I don't necessarily know at compile time that this is going to be a savings account and this one's going to be a checking account. So what we need to do is we need to go to the V table, which stood for virtual table. And then we, we looked up which method you actually wanted to call, and then it was dispatched then at runtime. Runtime means dynamic. Dynamic means runtime. And if the compiler is able to do it, we call it static. It's done at compile time instead. Right? Uh, and again, it's static dispatch. Well, you can take this another step and look at, uh, do I want to do one, two, three, four, five? Can I do this? Operator overloading. Okay, yeah, it works like this, good. Operator overloading. So let me go ahead and give you a piece of uh, code here. Uh, I'll go into code mode here, Java. Let me go ahead and create a string, s is equal to hello, right? And then int a is equal to 10, right? Now if I go like this, a plus s. Now I haven't declared anything on the left-hand side here, but what would you interpret that to mean? It's a plus sign, right? What does a plus sign mean? addition or in this case it's got to be concatenation because we've got a string and an integer when you've got a uh, what if I did it like this instead let me go ahead and create another int b is equal to 20 a plus b right. now what do I mean in the second the last line there a plus b what's the interpretation there now now that is addition right 
So same operator in different contexts with different meanings. Right? That's, what's me well, that's what we mean by operator overloading. An operator, the plus operator, has more than one meaning. If you go and mix types, a string and a string, right, then that obviously means concatenate them together. If you have a string and a non-string, that means convert this one to a string so that you can do concatenation and, and put them together, and the result is a string. right? String uh, r is equal to this, and then this would be int x is equal to that. right? The result of a number plus a number is going to be interpreted as addition. This is the only, uh, the, the above, is the only uh, met, uh, f uh, operator overloading in Java, right? Because you can get crazy with it. Uh, think about a, pro uh, a programming language like C++. Allows you to do whatever you want with operator overloading. So, for example, what does it mean if I've got, uh, here's a pitfall, right? What if I do have an array plus an array? How would you interpret that? Now, this is not Java. The, this is not allowed in Java for very good reason. You are not allowed to do uh, operator overloading in Java, thankfully. But in C++, you can do this. You can overload any operator that you want. You could overload it so that plus now means minus, and minus now ne means plus. Right? Uh, you, could, uh, you, you, could, you could do crazy stuff like that. Uh, but let's assume that we're not crazy and we're not going to do crazy stuff. This isn't that crazy. An array plus an array, that might be useful. How might it be, be useful? Okay, oh, concatenation. So it would be add the elements in the second to the end of the first. Okay, uh, creating a brand new array. If I, had f if I had ABC over here and one, two, three over here, now I've got ABC one, two, three, uh, 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 an array of size six. Is that the only interpretation you could have? Is anybody thinking of anything different? So you, uh, you, might be, uh, you might be taking 235 right now. What if I've got a set and another set, and I add them together? What, what are, what, what's one way that I can add something together with, res with respect to sets? Oh, OK. So uh, no, 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 no. now you're thinking 208, uh, math 208. If I've got a vector, a vector of four elements and a vector of four elements, and I go this vector plus this vector, then I go component-wise. These two get added together, these two get added together, these two get added together, and these two added, get added together. And now I have a vector of the vector summation, right? That's another interpretation. Uh, so it could be uh, or a vector vector summation, right? right? Components are added, right? What about sets? If I've got this set and this set and I add them together, what does that mean? It could be a union of the two. So if I've got ABC and AXY, then the union is not six elements. It's going to be five elements, because A is in both of them. So when I take the union, I'm just adding all this stuff together. Maybe it's unordered. So you could interpret this as maybe a union instead. Right? So those are three very, very reasonable interpretations of what it means to add two arrays together. Right? You kind of start seeing the problem. What if I did time plus time? What does that mean? What is 5 o'clock plus 2 o'clock? 7 o'clock, right? Well, 5 o'clock plus 2 hours is 7 o'clock. In other words, time plus duration gives me time. But what does time plus time mean? Uh, there's no inter reasonable interpretation there. You could say that it's 7 o'clock, but that doesn't jive or, with, or too, much, uh, too well with reality, right? So uh, is, is, it, uh, is it equal to time or, or time plus duration plus duration equals time, right? There come, uh, basically, the problem here is that um, uh, the operators have very well understood meanings, right? The, uh, and uh, redefining their meanings makes them ambiguous, right? So there's really no benefit to doing this in the end, because how do you end up doing this in C? Uh, a language like C++ allows this. You can do whatever crazy stuff that you want. Uh, you can go ahead and define time, and plus time is equal to time, whatever that means. Uh, but how do you define what it means? 
you're going to have to write a function to do it. Time plus time, when we, you take two, uh, uh, two uh, 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 parameters to that function, and then you return another parameter. In other words, you're going to have to write a function anyway, even, to, uh, even if you support operator overloading. You do so by writing a function. Now let's go back to the first example, array plus array. If you wanted that as concatenation, I would call that function array concatenation. If you wanted it as union, I would call it as array union. If you wanted it as, what was the other one? Uh, vector summation. Then I would call that vector summation. Right? And what does the name of the function tell you? It tells you exactly what it does, rather than having this ambiguous plus sign here. So in general, you should probably avoid this. But you should know that it is something. right? Uh, in, in Java, it is something with respect to the plus operator. Other programming languages don't allow you to do that. PHP, for example, or Perl, uh, uh, plus only has one meaning. There is no operator overloading at all. If you do plus, then it's going to interpret it as addition. Uh, to get concatenation, you have to use a different operator. And that in both of those language you use, languages, you use the period. So if I've got a string, period, another string, that's going to be concatenation. Right? Uh, Java supports this, but it's only built in, and it doesn't allow you to do your own thing. C++ would allow you to do whatever, you, whatever crazy stuff that you want. Right? So uh, it's best to avoid it. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, found a, oh, OK, was, was that it? Oh, OK. Um, Again, you've got also subtype polymorphism and a, a couple of other things. Uh, but otherwise, let's go ahead and go into miscellaneous. Right. So kind of a wrap up of uh, other things that you may find useful. Uh, for, example, for example, copy constructors. Right. So often, uh, often you have need to create a copy, of, uh, either, either strict or strict or modified uh, of an object. Right? Uh, and you want, uh, in general, what you want is a deep copy, either, sorry, either. Right? Uh, in general, in general, you want a deep copy. So do you remember what a deep copy, uh, not, not a shallow copy? Do you remember the difference between a deep copy and a shallow copy with respect to an array is in, say, uh, C, plus, C or C, uh, C from last semester. If I've got an array here, uh, one, two, three, and I make a sh uh, and and I've got a, a reference to it A, that's my first array, and I make a shallow copy of it. B is equal to this thing over here. That's a shallow copy. Let's take a look at what it looks like in Java. Uh, in fact, we'll, as a review here, let's look at it uh, with re with respect to arrays. Right. So if I've got an integer array, int uh, a r r. I'll, I'll just call it a, is equal to new uh, int of, let's just make it small, three elements. Right? And I'll go ahead and fill it up. Uh, a sub 0 is equal to 10. A sub 1 is equal to 20. Uh, a sub 2 is equal to 30. Right? And I want to create a copy of it. What if I did this? Right? Int b is, oops, sorry, I forgot my equal sign, is equal to a. Right? That is a shallow copy. Why is it called a shallow copy? What if I change the first one to, oops, 0 is equal to 42? Right? And then I go ahead and system.out.println a sub 0, the first one in a. What's that going to print? 42. Prints 42. Why? It was a shallow copy. A and B are references. They reference the exact same array. And so when I go and change B, uh, the first element in B, to 42, that's changed for A as well. Right? If you want a deep copy, uh, so how, how about we do a deep copy instead? How would I do that? Int b is equal to new uh, int of 3, right? Uh, and then I'll copy over things. b sub 0 is equal to a sub 0, right? And uh, if you wanted to keep this general, then you'd go into a for loop instead, right? So let's go into a for loop. For int i equals 0, I'm already tired of writing this code, right? There must be a better way. Length i, uh, b, uh, i plus plus, uh, and then we'll go ahead and copy b sub i over uh, to a or a sub i over to b sub i, right? There we go. There's my loop. 
right? Gee, that seems so useful. Maybe there's something out there. Arrays. Oh, here, let's just look up Java arrays. And let's look. Uh, I want the Java docs, not <laughs> your tutorials. Um, copy. It's not called deep copy, but it is called copy of. Right? It copies the specified array, truncating or padding with false if necessary, so that the copy has a specified length. That is a deep copy. It will actually create a new array, returning that. Let's look at integer instead, since that's what we're working with. Uh, it'll return a new array called int uh, that's a deep copy with everything copied over from the original. The new length here is so that you can grow or expand as you want. Right? If I've got an array of 10 elements and I want to copy over the, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, all the way up to 10, I want to copy over those elements, but I also want it of size 20. It'll do that for me if I say, here, copy this array of size 10, but make the new one 20, and it'll pad it out with zeros. If I've got an array of 10 elements and I only want the first five, then I can say, here, copy this, uh, this array of 10 elements, but only make the new, uh, uh, new, new copy five. If you want to just a straight up deep copy, then you copy it with the, uh, the, the same parameter, uh, the same length, right? Uh, so better. If I want int b is equal to arrays.copy of uh, a and a.length. Right? a.length is going to be the original length of it, so I'm getting a strict deep copy here. Right? So there's your, there, there's your review of deep versus shallow copies. And here, take another look. How many copy of, find co copy of, how many copy of functions do we have here? You can't see it, but one, two, three, four, five, blah, 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 there are 20 of them actually, because there's some up here. Oh no, not 20. How many are there? I do have to count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten. Do they have different n names? Do they have copy of for booleans, copy of for bytes, copy of for char? No, because what do we have? Uh, what aspect of polymorphism do we have in Java? We have function overloading. We don't have to name these things different things. And so now I don't have to remember what the names of those functions are. I can just say, oh, copy of, copy of, copy of, and let the compiler take care of the rest of the work for me. What does this look like with respect to objects, though? You can also you can also design your objects to have copy constructors. Right? And for this, I'm just going to do a demonstration. Right? Uh, I've got, I should have Eclipse open here. There we go. I'm going to go back to, say, uh, not my inner, uh, let's go with checking account here. Right? So you'll note here that we've got that super constructor. Uh, we've also got this constructor right here that takes, an, uh, it takes out all four aspects of a checking account, the, the account ID, the balance, the owner, and the monthly fee. Another thing to remember is that we made it immutable. You, uh, everything, it has getters. It has, uh, well, it doesn't have a get, mon uh, get monthly fee. No, it doesn't have a get monthly fee getter here, uh, but that's okay. We'll make it private. Maybe it'll warn us about that, that we don't have a getter, but we can add that later. I made it immutable. Meaning that once you create a checking account, you can't change it. Well, what's one thing that changes often for a checking account? The balance, the balance right? So one thing I could do is I could open that up with a setter, reset the balance. Or I could change it so that I've got my interface correct, and I could say, make deposit, which will add it internally for me, or make withdrawal, which will uh, subtract it automatically for me. Uh, another way that I could do this is through a, what's, uh, that, that's probably the best way, at least for this particular problem. But another way that you can handle this that you might want to think about for your assignment coming up is to make a copy constructor. What does a copy constructor look like with respect to a, save, a checking account? Well, it's a constructor, right? so it has to be called checking account. Is this big enough? No, nope. let me make this bigger. And zoom out, there we go, checking account. But what does it take as its input? Well, if you want a copy of this thing in my hand right here, I have to give you that thing. So it's going to be a checking account, and I'll call it that for now. That is not a, the best, right? I would, I would call this like C or account or something like that. I want to call it that for now to show you uh, for demonstration purposes, OK? I've got a copy of that. I want to copy that into this. Right? So what do I do? 
this dot, and what else? What do I have? Monthly fee. Monthly fee is equal to that dot monthly fee. Right? Uh, this dot balance is e uh, balance is equal to that dot balance. Balance. There we go. And now it's going to start complaining because I don't have access to that dot balance. Why? It's up here in the super class. There's the balance, but I've made it private. So I can't directly affect that. But what I can do is I can pull those three things out and pass it on up to the super constructor instead. Right? Like I did, uh, like I did on line 12. Super, that dot get account ID, that dot get balance, that dot get uh, owner. There we go. There. So I'm calling the super constructor, and now I have a deep copy. If you give me a checking account with these four aspects, I'm making another checking account with these four as aspects, and it's a complete copy. If you, if you did make it mutable and you can change this one over here, then this one over here is not changed. Very, very useful, right? What if you did want to change? So that's a pure copy constructor. You could also go with a hybrid copy constructor. Where am I? There we go. I'm going to go ahead and leave that there. But what if I not only have a checking account that I want you to copy over the account name, I want you to account, copy over the owner, everything, except for the balance. I've got a new balance for you. So double, double balance. There we go. Well, instead of passing the, that, that balance up to the super constructor, I can pass the balance that you just gave me to the super constructor. And now, uh, instead of copying all, of the, all four things over, it copied those three things over, and then it gave it a new value. So now these two things are different. This one has a balance of, say, $100. This one has a balance of $200. And it's, it, it's all done with a copy constructor. This is so useful that you find it all over the Java, uh, Java, the, the Java standard library. Uh, let me go back to, do I have string up still? Nope, uh, Java string. And let's look at its constructors. Uh, there, there. A uh, bunch of constructors, constructors. Oh, hey, what does that look like right there? You want a new string given this old string. You just want to copy it over so that it's a deep copy. Now, again, you can't change a string because it's immutable, but you do have a completely separate copy for whatever reason you might want. That's not that useful because, again, strings are immutable. But things that are not immutable would include, say, an, uh, a list, um, Java list. What do you see here as far as constructor? Uh, there might not be constructors here because this is an interface, so let's go with Java array list. There we go. Uh, no, I don't want W3C schools. Uh, let's see. Let's look at its constructors. Ooh. What do you see there? I can create an array list copying over any collection whatsoever, meaning that if I, gave, uh, if, if I have a set, I want to make a deep copy, but I want to make that set into a list. I want to give it an order, an ordering. Or if I've got uh, another list, uh, an array list, and I want to convert that into a linked list, I can do that. Right? Uh, and that's all done through copy constructor. This is a copy constructor because it takes one collection and makes a deep copy of, of that collection so that you, know, you have two different collections, just like that we did with the, the array that we just did, where you have a deep copy so that changes to one don't affect the other. Right? Uh, it's all over. So if you want to think about using that as one of your design principles in your assignment, uh, I, I would encourage you to do so. Right? Uh, but the, the, uh, those are copy constructors. Uh, you also have something called mixins. Right? Uh, what I want four. There we go. Mixins. So forget about programming for a second. What's a mixin? Uh, I don't know. If you go to what, what's the best ice cream place? Coldstone. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything better? I'll try it out. No. Okay. So we've got. They don't call them mixins, but what do they do? Here's your ice cream. Oh, by the way, do you want anything else with that? What can you mix into it? You can mix in. Uh, no, nobody goes to ice cream stores anymore, huh? You can put in sprinkles. You can put in peanut butter cups. You can put in uh, M&Ms, et cetera, et cetera, right? Those are mix-ins. You put it in, and then you mix it in, right? 
Well, what does that mean in the context of object-oriented programming? It means that a variable or method or aspect uh, that can be mixed in to an object. Right? The main culprit here that I'm thinking of is JavaScript. Right? Uh, you do have objects, but no classes. Right? Now, you, now you do have classes as of 2015. I'm thinking classic JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript, you don't have classes. You have what are called prototypes. Uh, it's called ex nihilo, right? From uh, Latin for from nothing. So I, you, here's an object. Here's an empty object. Uh, I want this object to become a checking account. So I want it to have a balance. Okay, throw that in. Right? You mix it in. Uh, after it's been created, I've got the, I've got my object in my hand right here, right? It, it's not a it, it's not from a class uh, that I constructed it. There are no constructors. Uh, instead, it's just right here. It's an empty object. If I want this to become a savings account, I need to throw in a balance. I need to throw in an APR. I need to throw in uh, a, a get monthly earnings function, right? Add a function to this thing. You just mix it in, and that's how you create your objects. And those are called mix-ins. Uh, Java eight. <laughs> Uh, introduced uh, default methods to interfaces. And so this is as close as you're going to get to mix-ins in Java. Uh, it's kind of a mistake, in my opinion, that they did this, because uh, it, it make, uh, what it does is it, de uh, is it demotes interfaces down to abstract classes. Remember the difference between an interface and an abstract class? An interface is purely abstract. It only defines that it, uh, that it must have these functions. It doesn't actually define what they do. But down here with abstract classes, you can have uh, abstract methods where, where you don't define what you do, like you, uh, like you did up here in the uh, uh, interfaces. Or you can have actually have the, uh, methods that do something. right? By, by putting default methods up here in the interface uh, level, you've, pro you've demoted them down here just so that everything's an abstract class now. Uh, and so it's, it was kind of a mistake, in my opinion. And the, the, the number of use cases are extremely small in Java anyway. But in other programming languages, like, say, JavaScript, this is how you do things. You mix stuff in. You create your objects by just throwing something in. That leads to a consequence uh, called uh, and I'll, 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 uh, question mark typing. Right? So consider, consider a, uh, a dynamically typed programming language, like, say, PHP or Python. Right? Python is a multi-paradigm programming language, meaning that it has aspects of both uh, object-oriented programming and, uh, and procedural programming, like C, and also a couple of uh, uh, functional programming. You can define classes in Python. right? So let me go ahead and theoretically here, if, for those of you that know Python, you'll, see, uh, you'll, you'll be able to answer this. Create a student class. right? def class or whatever the syntax is that I forget off the top of my head. Later on, s is equal to student. Now later on, how do I know that s is a student when I didn't declare it? In a, in a, in a, strongly, or in a, in a statically typed programming language like, say, Java, here we go, uh, if I go int a is equal to 5, that variable is an integer, and it will always be an integer, and it will never be anything else. But what about a dynamically, program, a pro, a dynamically typed programming language like Python? Right. How, do I, uh, how do I do uh, int a? Do I do int a is equal to 10 for Python people, Pythoners? In fact, wow, it's smart enough that it doesn't even know what an int is if you see the color coding there. Right. Instead, what do you do? A equals 10. Right. Now, later on in the program, what if I say that a is equal to, I don't know, Hello. There we go. Is, that's perfectly fine in Python, right? It's changed its type. Well, what if later on I go, oops, uh, leave that. Oh, should I be doing semicolons? I forget. No. Uh, no. I think you can uh, in Python 3, but it's not necessary or it's, it's discouraged. It's not, Python, it's not the Pythonic way of doing things. A is equal to, now how do I create a new student? Something like this, maybe. Something looks something like this for uh, you don't have the keyword new, right? No, it was something like that. All right. Well, later on, yet again in my program, how do I know that A is a student? 
in Java, I knew that A was an integer because I had a guarantee that it was an integer for the rest of that variable's life. Here you can see in Python, this variable has now changed three times. What's to stop it from changing a fourth time so that it's not a student anymore? Right? This leads to a problem that is solved as follows. And let's not talk about students anymore. Let's talk about a duck. Right? What defines a duck? Feathers, okay. What's the old What's the old saying? If you see something waddling, and you see something quacking, what is it? That's a duck, right? If it If it walks like a duck, if it talks like a duck, then it's a duck, and that's where we get the, the concept of duck typing, right? In a programming language like uh, Java, or in a programming language like uh, Python or PHP, where a variable does not have a fixed type. You have to rely on duck typing. Uh, you, uh, if you really need to know, I need an absolute guarantee that A is a duck. You need to check. Oh, does this object have a quack method? Does this object have a waddle method? And if the answer to those two questions are yes, then for all intents and purposes, it's a duck. If it walks like a duck, if it uh, talks like a duck, then it's a duck. Right? If it's uh, if you've got a student and you have got a get NUID method and a get first name method and a, a compute grade method then it must be a student. Right? Uh, it can be, lead to very, very bad habits of, uh, OK, I, have an a I need an absolute guarantee that the thing that I get in this, uh, in the, in this I'm writing a function now. Uh, and one of the parameters is supposed to be a student. Well, how do I have a guarantee that it's a student? I don't. So I need to write a bunch of checks. Does it have a get, uh, let's say again, say duck. Does it have a waddle method? Does it have a, uh, a quack method? If so, I'm free to proceed. If not, then I can throw an exception. Wait a second, you gave me something that doesn't look like a duck, right? Uh, I, I require you to give me a duck. And so now all of your compiler time issues, where the compiler can say, that's not a duck, right? Uh, now become runtime issues, where you either have to uh, make a bunch of checks and then do error handling yourself, or you have to just live with it and say, well, whether or not it's a duck, I'll just go ahead and call the quack method uh, and cross my fingers, and it'll be a runtime error now. Uh, and and, uh, and well, that, that's on you. I told you that I need a duck, and you didn't give me a duck. Right? Uh, unfortunately, it's, uh, the, the, that's what you have to live with in a dynamically typed programming language like PHP, Java, or JavaScript, and uh, Python. Right? There are, by the way, efforts to impose static typing on those languages. Uh, for example, JavaScript has alternatives like TypeScript and CoffeeScript, uh, which impose on top of them uh, more strict uh, typing, so that uh, you do have a compiler that, uh, that, ha that takes CoffeeScript and transpiles it down to JavaScript after doing all of those checks. Uh, you have, uh, in Python, I think that there's also a movement to try to get more strict typing, uh, more strict checking, uh, and, and, and definitely PHP. There are other PHP. Uh, languages on top of PHP that enforce strict typing. So in the dynamic versus strict typing war, I, I, strict typing is winning out, in my opinion. Right? Uh, it, it seems that way, at least. Uh, nobody is going dynamic typing from the beginning. Right? OK, so those are a few miscellaneous things. So as a summary here, let's talk about the solid principles. Right? So solid oh, principles, there we go. Solid principles are five principles. Uh, do I have a who it can? Oh, yeah, here we go. Uh, it's a collection of principles and guidelines intended uh, to lead to better, that is, more stable, more readable, more maintainable, and ex extensible object oriented programming code. It's due to Ro uh, Robert Martin and Michael Feathers in the early 2000s. Uh, I think that they might have written a series of books on it, uh, but they came up with the solid principles. And some of them kind of are complementary to each other, and some of them kind of work together, just like abstraction and, and, and encapsulation work together. Uh, and it's kind of hard to separate them. Some of these solid principles seem that way to me, at least, uh, as well. Uh, I, th I think that they just needed a cool acronym. So OK, let's go ahead. Uh, yeah, I need an S. Oh, yeah, OK, we can spell solid now, right, if, uh, if we identify these things. Uh, each one of them stands for a different principle. The S stands for single responsibility principle. And what this means is that every unit, that is module or class, should have one and only one responsibility. 
responsibility, there you go, uh, or one piece of functionality. Right. Uh, and just at a very, very high level here, uh, a person class, person class, should only do person things, right? A, uh, it, it not address things, or what else did we put in there? Uh, or bank account things, right? Good abstraction, good encapsulation means that, like we, like we did at the very start, when we started thinking, well, what is a bank account? Well, it's these things, these things, these things. Oh, by the way, it also has an owner. Well, an owner has a first name and a last name. And an owner also has an address, which is a street, city, state, and zip. Right? So we started listing all these things out that we needed, but then we immediately identified, well, wait a second. This is actually three things. This is a bank account, this is a person, and this is an address. We need to separate these out so that we have three classes, each one of them with a single responsibility. The address class is responsible for address things. The person class is responsible for person things. We could have gone a step further, uh, and we, we, could have, uh, we could have said that, well, a person also has a bunch of emails. Maybe we need an email class. What would the email class be responsible for? Maybe the validation of emails, right? If I just have hello foo at blah, blah, blah dot com, well, that, that is a valid email address. But if I, just, uh, go, uh, if I forgot the at sign, that's not a valid email address. If I have a, uh, 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 I could have a valid domain name, but then it actually doesn't resolve anything because it's a fake domain.com or something, right? That's probably real though. Uh, uh, so what the email class could do is it could validate that this is a, a valid formed email. And also it's a real email because it, uh, I contacted the server and the server said, yeah, that's the, the, the server was alive, right? That's not a person thing. That's not an address thing. That's an email thing. So you need to separate those concerns, separate that, uh, that functionality out into its own class so that not everything is responsible for every, uh, everything else, right? The antithesis, antithesis, right, is the god or god object anti-pattern. Remember, we d briefly discussed this, that if you put everything into one class, that's the god class. It knows everything, it does everything, it sees everything. That is the antithesis, the opposite of the single responsibility principle. You're giving one class the responsibility of everything. Right? You don't want to do that. You want to keep things simple. You want, to, uh, you want to have as small of units as possible so that you're only worried about a person things in the person class. Okay? Uh, let's see. Another example that you might have done on your second assignment. Uh, you have to load data and then serialize data, right? How many responsibilities does that sound like? Loading up a data from a bunch of CSV files and then persisting them to an XML file. XML and JSON, right? XML. Now how many, now how many responsibilities does that sound like? Three, right? Loading of the data, well, that's just the input CSV file. So maybe if I had a data loader class, that's only responsible for loading up the data. Now, now I've got a different concern. Now I've got a different responsibility. I need to serialize them to XML, right? I can have a two XML class that handles all that stuff. Now I've got another responsibility, uh, outputting them, serializing them down to a JSON. So maybe that's an argument for yet another class, a, a two JSON serialization class. If you've got three responsibilities here, you should probably be thinking about making three different classes. Now, I, I imagine a good chunk of you uh, actually put all of that into one main, right? You need to get out of that habit. That's a very bad habit. You need to have the single responsibility principle. And uh, here's a prime example of why you would want to do this. Suppose you had all three of those things in one class. In this, well, here, in the second phase, you are only concerned with this first one now, loading up the data. You no longer have to serialize it in the second one, right? You have to actually produce a report. Is the code that took all three of these responsibilities and put them into one class, is that gonna work anymore? No, because you have two irrelevant things that you're doing now, right? So you're probably, if you did that, you're probably going to want to refactor that, rewrite it, so that you, you, you split out those responsibilities. 
And there was already a question on Piazza about, uh, about this, like, do we have to worry about the serialization going forward? No. So your solution might be simply be to delete those two things, right? Whereas if you had de uh, designed them well to begin with, with three different concerns, oh, well, that class sitting over there, that, that, it doesn't matter. It's not hurting anybody. I'm not going to delete it. But you have a very, very strong inclination to delete those two other responsibilities now because you've mixed them all together. Another example, data loading from CSV files. That's going to change in another, uh, in another phase of your project so that you're no longer loading them up from CSV files. You're instead loading them up from the database. So you, now you've got two different, uh, you've got one kind of, I, I, I need products, I need persons, I need whatever. But now you have two different data sources. If you had separated out that, uh, that responsibility, then, well, okay, well, now I no longer need this CSV file. I can, I, can change, I can change whatever I'm doing over here to instead of reading from the CSV files, I'll read it from that data source instead. And if, you've got, if, if you're following a, a single responsibility principle, then that's uh, so much easier to just switch. Otherwise, you're stuck deleting big chunks of code or refactoring and rearranging big, big chunks of code. The second one is the open and closed responsibility principle, or open and closed principle, excuse me. There's no responsibility in there. So software units like classes, modules, and methods should be open for extension, but closed for modification. This is a classic example of inheritance. Uh, you extend the behavior, and in fact, extend is the keyword that Java chose to use because that's exactly what you're doing, uh, without changing the super classes code. Uh, if I want to, uh, it, it, the reason that you want to do this is because, say I've got a bank account and a savings account, and I'm going to create a new money market account, right? So I can extend the, uh, the behavior of the bank account over here without having to, to muck up with the, 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 uh, the, the super class, the bank account up here. What if, I, what if I violated this principle? What if to do that instead I did uh, screw up with the, or screw with the, uh, the bank account up here, right? That screws up everything below it. Because if, I, if it's open for modification instead of closed for modification, that means I am changing something up here. I'm changing everything that depends on that or that uses it. If I've got some code over there that, used, that, uh, that, uh, that thought of a bank account one way and I went and changed it, I now broke that code over there. So it should be open for modification because I do want to create new types of bank accounts, a money market account, a Christmas account, whatever. I want to extend the behavior. But I don't want to break the behavior up here in uh, higher in the hierarchy because it breaks everything else and breaks everything that uses it. Right? Um, uh, do I have an example? Uh, nope. It's, it's, uh, oh, yep. Uh, I, I don't have an example. The, the, that was the example, uh, the bank account example. Uh, so again, mul uh, multiple. Uh, multiple things might depend on it, so you don't want to go and screw it up because modifying it would potentially break the expectations or behavior elsewhere. Uh, superclasses provide general behavior and should never uh, be changed. Right? Uh, that is, they are closed uh, or they'll break the hierarchy right, that you've defined. Thus, one consequence of this principle is that uh, you must have a well-designed hierarchy to begin with. All right. So really think about your hierarchical uh, relations in your, in your project and, and anything that you're doing. Uh, if you go and start just, oh, OK, well, I'll go ahead and throw this together and see, uh, see what works. Well, and then, uh, and then oh, OK, well, that wasn't quite right, but we'll go ahead and go with it. And you start writing thousands and thousands and thousands of lines of code that depends on that hierarchy. You cannot go back to that hierarchy and change it. Oh, this actually should not be in a subclass of this. This should have been a subclass over here. Changing that hierarchy has now broken the thousands and thousands of lines of code that you wrote that depends on that hierarchy. So that's why we want it to be closed for, uh, closed for modification, but open to extension. Right? OK, I've got now a new, uh, I, I, I have a new bank account or new things that I need to do. That's fine. Here's, leave the hierarchy alone and just extend it. Right? And that's one of the advantages of, um, uh, of, uh, of inheritance. Right? The L in the solid principle is the Liskov substitution principle, uh, named, uh, named for Barbara Liskov, the one that came up with it. Uh, and she stated the, just as follows. I'll just quote, if S is a subtype of T, 
then objects of type T may be replaced with objects of type S without altering any of the, sorry, desired behavior or desired properties, right? Um, this is kind of what's called strong behavioral subtyping. To get, the, to get at what I'm talking about here, I'm going to give you a picture. So we've got a bird, a robin, and an ostrich. An ostrich uh, is a bird. A robin is a bird. But is a bird necessarily an ostrich? Nope, it could be a robin. Right? What if you try to force them to become other things? If you take a robin and you make it become a bird, that's perfectly fine. That's called a covariant coercion type. You are making a subtype become a, a supertype, which by the Liskov substitution principle should be OK. If you take a bird and try to force it to become an ostrich, that's, not, that's generally not OK. If you got lucky and, oh yeah, this was an ostrich, actually, uh, then it's OK to force it to become an ostrich. Uh, but and, and that's called a contravariant type. It's, sometimes it's OK, but you're crossing your fingers or throwing the dice and, and taking your chances. What is never OK is an invariant coercion type. Can you ever force a robin to become an ostrich or vice versa? No. So an invariant coercion type is never OK. A, co uh, a covariant type is always OK. A contravariant is sometimes OK. But you have to be very, very careful. Right? If you were to, get to do a contravariant uh, coercion type in Java, you would have to check, is it an instance of? Right? Uh, I showed you that very, very briefly uh, last week uh, using the instance of with the re square rectangle problem. Uh, I printed out, is it a square? Yes. Is it a rectangle? Yes. Is it a shape? Yes. All three of those things returned true. And so you can, you can use instance of to do that. But again, if you find yourself using instance of, you're doing something wrong. Because you are kind of violating the, bar, the Liskov substitution principle. Right? Uh, you, have not, uh, you have not designed the correct uh, interface or the correct um, uh, abstraction so that you can just write a program and not have to worry about those low-level details. You don't ask questions of, is this a savings account? Oh, if so, OK, I'll do, go ahead and do this. Or is this a checking account? OK, then I'll do this. If you find yourself doing a bunch of if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else, if, you're doing something wrong. right? The, you're back in the C world, right? where you are checking, uh, do I need, uh, wh which case do I need, actually need to do here, where you don't have inheritance and you don't have the Liskov substitution principle. Right? So make sure that you've got the correct uh, the, 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 uh, it's, um, the correct inheritance. Right? And again, the antithesis of this, I'll go ahead and just put this here uh, so it's uh, complete. Uh, the antithesis of this is the square rectangle problem, where if you do allow <coughs> your objects to become a different thing uh, through uh, getters and setters, then you're violating the Liskov substitution principle. Okay. As I said, a lot of these are kind of, re I see it as kind of non-unique things, that they're, they're kind of repetitions of each other. So now we're in the I of solid, S-O-L-I-D. The I of solid is the interface segregation principle. Uh, and the, the quote here from the original is going to be that no client should be forced to depend on methods that it does not use. Uh, the example here that I'm going to give you is uh, event clicker. There we go. What if I have an, a click event handler interface? Right? You're doing graphical user inter interface programming. And when somebody clicks the mouse, you, uh, you fire off this code over here. Uh, and, if, if, and if that's the interface uh, that defines on click, that's perfectly fine. That's what I want. But if that interface also defines on double click, so that you might want to do, maybe you want to do something else on a double click instead. Right? Click and double click, are, they're two different events. But if I have an, a click event handler that specifies both of those, then I want to create a handler that, uh, that implements that interface. I'm forced to implement both of those functions. Whether or not I only, I don't care about double clicks. If they double click on it, I don't care. I just want a single click. But this design has forced me to consider both of those cases. Uh, the way that I would usually take care of this is by saying, OK, on double click, that'll throw an exception. I don't care. Or on double click, that simply just calls on click, right? Uh, that's my workaround because uh, they, they violated the interface segregation principle. The interface segregation principle says that that interface should not have those both methods. You should segregate, segregate them out into two different interfaces, uh, a, uh, a click event handler and a double click event handler. 
Right? Now I'm not forced to do both. If I want to do both of them, that's perfectly fine. I can implement both of those interfaces and bring them in because of multiple inheritance for interfaces in Java. But if I don't want, if I only want one or the other, now it's more flexible. I can do, do neither and then I'm doing something else entirely. Or I can do uh, double clicks or just uh, single clicks or both of them at the same time. Putting them to both together in the same uh, interface means that I am forced to worry about everything. Another classic example is the ArrayList implementation, uh, the ArrayList uh, 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 interface, or, or an ArrayList. Uh, for that, I still have my other picture here. Let's come over here, and I will zoom in. All right, there we go. So uh, there's a, an ArrayList down there, and if you follow all three of these things back, it's serializable, it has random access, and what else does it have? Uh, it has clonable. So it has these three things right here. Each of these three things is a very, very small interface. In fact, serializable uh, and random access, they don't even define any functions. They don't define any methods whatsoever. They just, uh, they just add an aspect to an array list, saying that the array list is array based, therefore it, is, uh, it, is, uh, it, is, it has random access. You can jump from the start of the array, jump to the 10th element without having to go through the first nine elements, like you do with a linked list. That's something that we'll explore later. Uh, it's, uh, it's serial, everything is serializable, uh, but it doesn't define a method. Uh, I don't think it uh, technically defines a method at all. It just says what it is. Right? So that's yet another example of keeping things small so that you can inherit, you can take off the shelf what you want. If you look at the other collections here, tree set, uh, in fact, uh, tree set takes just serializable and clonable, but not random access because it doesn't have random access. But it also takes navigable list and sorted set. Right? You can pick and choose. It makes it a lot more flexible. Right? And that's the interface segregation principle. Interfaces, interfaces should be as small as possible. Maybe uh, at most one or two or zero methods. So keep your interfaces small, and you will not lock, you won't lock anybody into ha being forced to implement all of the methods that you define. Small and uh, small means flexible. Finally, the D of uh, the solid principles, the dependency inversion principle, or uh, yeah, dependency inversion principle. And the uh, statement here uh, from uh, from the, the original people were uh, high-level modules should not depend on low-level modules. Both should depend on abstractions. Okay? Or uh, put another way, abstractions should depend, uh, not depend on details. Uh, instead, details should depend on abstractions. You're kind of flipping it. What that means in, practical uh, in a practical sense. Okay? I'll give you a, a, a general example here, and then we'll look at a specific example, maybe from your homework. So some class A may depend on some class B, right? Uh, either through a superclass subclass relationship or maybe through composition or something like that, or maybe it creates them. Uh, it's important to remain extensible, and so much of the logic should be inverted and given to class B. So A depends on B. And we're not talking about a superclass uh, subclass here. A depends on B. So uh, the, the dependency should actually be inverted, and most of the details should be taken care of, of by B, while uh, class A changes its reference to more generic types. In other words, all the responsibilities over in here in A, I'm going to take them out and put them over here into B. That way, if I, have, if I want to do things a different way, maybe I've got C over here that does everything that B does, but just in a different way. I can swap that, over, swap that out over here, and now I'm doing things in a different way, I, uh, but uh, without having to write, rewrite the code over here. Right? Here is an ex uh, a, a, a more concrete example. Right? Suppose that I've got a logger class, right? and uh, something that just logs information to a system. By the way, doing this in homework five and beyond, I think, is going to be worth bonus to actually using log instead of, uh, a logger instead of the standard output. Uh, because the standard output is bad. The standard output is very specific behavior. It outputs to a terminal. Well, guess what? Nobody's sitting at a terminal 24-7 just sitting there looking for something to happen. Instead, what you probably want in a real system is for error messages or information messages to be output to a log file, right? or maybe to a log database, 
Or maybe you do want them to go out uh, to the standard output to the console, right? Well, you could have a logger class that has a log to file or a log to console or a log to database DB, right? You could have maybe those three things. And then in your class, in, in, your, in your person class, I want a log that a person was created or that a per, uh, somebody's balance went up by $10, right? Uh, and and I'm, in the, I'm, I'm in the bank account class now, and I just received a, a deposit for $10. I want to log that somewhere. OK, I'll go ahead and log that to the file, right? All right, I'll call, I've got my logger here. Log, uh, log this information to the file. And it says, OK, I'll go ahead and do that for you. Right? Now our business rules have changed. We want to actually store this in the database because we want to uh, run queries on it or something. OK, that's fine. I have to go in and change my code to instead of going log to, uh, log to file, I have to change that line to log to database now. Right? I had to change A. A depended on the logger, B. That's a bad design. That is, uh, that is uh, I need to invert that dependency. I need to take that line of code that logs to a specific uh, resource, uh, resource, and I need to move it out over here into B, a logger class. Right? And when I do that, I just have a generic log. Right? It logs to wherever it's going to log to. Now I've got three different classes. I've got a class, uh, I've got a, instead of a log, gener generic logger class, I've, I've got a logger interface maybe, but a file logger, a console logger, and a database logger. When I create my class over here, I can inject that with whatever I want. I could say, all right, well, you get a file logger. Oh, no, you get a, a database logger. Right? And I can change how it works by simply giving it a new type of logger. I didn't change any code over here. Right? A was, uh, w w the, the dependency was inverted. Instead of de uh, A depends on B, but instead of actually using B, it, it says uh, it, 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 the, the, uh, the dependency went out over here. And in between is something new a logger interface. Right? Uh, my, my, three, uh, my three different types of loggers over here, console logger, uh, file logger, database logger, they all implement this one log generic logger interface. My bank account class over here now takes that one generic uh, interface. And it, knows, it doesn't know that it's logging to the console or logging to the database. It just knows that it's logging somewhere. Right? And so now the dependency has been inverted. A no longer depends directly on B. And B no longer de depends in any way on A. Instead, there's something in between, an interface. So that A depends on the interface. B implements the interface so that you can take, oh, OK, well, I don't want to do uh, file logging anymore. Throw that away. Database logging now. right? And now I've got a, 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 now I didn't have to change any code over here in these two things. I, and I really didn't have to change any code over here. I just had to extend it. Right? And so that's what dependency inversion means. If you find yourself uh, locking yourself into a hierarchy or locking yourself into a dependency, that is where you, that, that's at a point where you need to invert things. Right? And those are the solid principles. It's, uh, they come up all the time with object-oriented programming. They're not one of the four pillars. Remember, the four pillars are encapsulation, uh, abstraction, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. These five things came out later that uh, were observations of what does good object-oriented programming look like? Well, it looks solid, right? It looks like uh, a good object-oriented programming means that you have a single responsibility, that you've separated out concerns into different classes. Uh, that in your inheritance hierarchy, you well defined it as, so that it doesn't have to change. Uh, and that you can always extend it, but you don't change it up here. Right? Uh, it also means that you can swap things out without worrying about the details. That I can swap in a, a console logger or a file logger, and it, and it works exactly as before. Right? I don't have to change any code up here. Uh, it works. Uh, it, it, you have lots of small little interfaces that you can pick and choose from, and it makes it more flexible. And finally, uh, you don't have uh, depend. Uh, you don't have closely knit dependencies because if you have closely knit dependencies, you might as well might as well have taken everything in B and just thrown it into A. Uh, and so now A is a bank account and it's a logger at the same time, a file logger. Uh, that again, that violates the single responsibility principle. So all of these things work in conjunction with each other. Uh, if you're violating one of these principles, you you might be violating several of these principles. Uh, they're principles. They're not rules. Right? You can write very, very good object-oriented programming code that works, that 
doesn't have anything to do with these principles. Uh, you can write very, uh, really, really bad object-oriented programming code that adheres to these principles. We call that over-engineering, right? Uh, if, you, uh, if, for, uh, if, if you do want to, uh, and you see this all the time, say, uh, when you've got hundreds of classes, when uh, the classic example is, uh, what is it? Uh, enterprise Hello World, right? So uh, Enterprise Hello World. Right. So the joke here is, oh, no, FizzBuzz. There we go. Uh, FizzBuzz Enterprise Edition. Right. So FizzBuzz is print numbers out 1 to 100, except if it's divisible by 3, print out Fizz. If it's divisible by 5, print out Buzz. If it's divisible by both, then you print out FizzBuzz. Well, you can take things too far. You can over-engineer stuff. You can use design patterns too much. You can too rigidly uh, follow the, uh, the, the solid principles. And when that happens, you can have an explosion of classes. Let's see how this is for C sharp. What is this? Uh, enterprise quality code. Uh, no, it's Java. All right. So serious business. Uh, so it does something very simple. All it does is print out one to a hundred with those with those modifications. But they've got how many <laughs> classes to do that? This is this uh, th this is a uh, this is a joke example of what happens when you over engineer. What happens when you adhere to these principles too well? Right. Uh, that now your code base explodes and it's way too complex, way, uh, way more complex than you ever needed it to be for some, something simple. So there is something to be said for the, the KISS principle, the keep it simple principle. Uh, and they're always going to be competing, right? And you have to find that healthy medium of we want to keep it simple and accomplish our goals and accomplish the business logic, but we also want to be as general as possible so that we can extend the, uh, the behavior in the future. There's some happy medium there. You don't want to go and over-engineer it and have a thousand classes to do one simple thing just for the sake of the solid principles or for design patterns. Uh, but also, you don't want to make it so that it's so uh, rigid or it, it, it's so simple that you can't extend it, right? You can't add a, a money market account in the future, right? So keep those principles in mind that you're looking for that happy medium. Uh, a lot of people, when they see design patterns or when they see uh, solid principles or something, they, they, they go off, uh, they go off and uh, they, they, they treat it like a religion. We have to do this. We have to, uh, we have to adhere to these principles uh, uh, as much as possible. Well, no, there's some, some happy medium in there, the, uh, the Goldilocks zone, uh, where it's not too hot, not, not too complex, not too simple. It's just right. right? Uh, and then if you have to, one way or the other, uh, come in and refactor it to make it more general, refactor it to make it more simple uh, and more maintainable, then th those are the kinds of things that you need, that, that where you get into the more art of software development and software engineering rather than the science of it. Right? Uh, th th there's, there's where healthy debates uh, uh, exist. All right, I think we should do this in an interface. No, I, think we, I don't think we need that, right? And you can have a little healthy debate about it. That's how I've tried to design your assignments so that especially if you team up with somebody, you can have that healthy debate. Should we make this into an interface? Should we make this into an abstract class? There's no one right answer, right? It all depends on what you want to do. Uh, and there are some clearly wrong answers, and there are some clearly right answers. But everything else in the middle, that's open for discussion and open for interpretation. So keep that in mind as you're designing stuff. There's no one right design for your assignment, OK? Any questions? No? OK. Then next time, we'll start uh, completely new on SQL. If you want to you, uh, follow along, you should. Uh, let me go open it up. Uh, if you want to get your SQL account, uh, uh, if you go to cse.unl.edu slash account, you log in here, uh, then you'll have an option to reset your MySQL password. And then it'll get emailed to you if you want to start working with uh, working along on Thursday with me uh, by connecting to your own database. All right. Oh, and then the other thing that I would suggest, I'll, I'll put this on Piazza, but uh, the other thing I would suggest is MySQL Workbench. There are lots of solutions like this, and so if you want to use something else, it's it's basically an IDE, Integrated Development Environment for SQL. The reason I suggest this is because it's free and it works. Uh, if you want to find something else uh, and, and use something else, that's completely on, uh, up to you. Right? Uh, you can spend thousands of dollars on IDEs for SQL if you really want to. I'm not going to.